Welcome back to the Original Gangsters Podcast. I'm Jimmy Bucciolato, a.k.a. The Doctor, here in studio with my intrepid colleague and co-conspirator, Scott Bernstein. Hey, now. Hey, now. <laughs> and uh, Benny's in the house. Roberto was in here a few minutes ago. And uh, thanks for listening. Just want to remind everyone, please subscribe to our channel. Uh, the podcast is on Spotify, Google Podcast, Apple, iTunes. We have our video channel on YouTube. So please subscribe and support us. Please spread the word. We appreciate that. And we've been doing this podcast for about four years now. And uh, we're it's a labor of love. We provide each episode um, you know, at no cost. We're happy to put it out there to the public. But we've mentioned this before. Uh, the three of us all have day jobs. And uh, it takes a considerable amount of time and resources to put this content out each week. And so we will have some opportunities coming up soon for the for the first time for our audience to support us. And uh, that way we can continue to to put out this kind of content. So, uh, Ben, you want to Ben, you want to jump in and talk about that a little bit? Yeah, uh, we're probably going to be doing uh, some Patreon uh, where we will have some added content. Um, talking about uh, certain uh, famous gangsters and stuff. We'll have our polls and discuss our polls, and we'll also probably have a uh, GoFundMe page as well, and we'll definitely announce that on all of our socials when we get that going. And uh, if you could, please, please support. We'll greatly appreciate it. I know Scott and Jimmy uh, work a lot, do a lot of work researching, and um, uh, they take a lot of time out of their day to do this. So uh, please support them. I, I'm gonna, you know, uh, do a little like calling my shot here. Uh, once we get, you know, the Patreon up and running, um, I think one of the pieces of exclusive content that you're gonna get will be like another show once a week. Um, Jimmy will be there sometimes. I'll be there every week, uh, kind of breaking down uh, current breaking news, uh, you know, anything that's kind of of top of mind. Uh, maybe we could have some, you know, special uh, exclusive guests. Um, also, just some just for Q &A. just for right. A lot of people some have Q questions A's. for you on yeah. social media. Uh, you know, for for uh, you know, elite subscribers. So lo looking forward to that and. Uh, We'll see uh, see how it plays. Yeah, so thanks again, everyone, for listening. Please subscribe. Follow us on social media, Twitter, Facebook, and uh, Instagram. So in terms of today's content, uh, we have a, a major announcement in terms of uh, a major format change here at the Original Gangsters <laughs> Podcast. Uh, we've decided that in order to increase our numbers, we're just going to talk about John Gotti every week. So Gotti? Uh, no, it's going to be Gotti, <laughs> Capone, and Whitey Bulger. Yeah, so Gotti's... Gardner, <laughs> uh, one week we'll have Gotti's hairstylist on. So anyhow, I'm just throwing a little shade at. There, I think no, they're just so, other you know, shows are very there's some other con there's some other content producers out there, and you know we don't want to get into a back and forth, but I I find it. Um, you know, I, I just I, all the time. I, a lot of it's just mafia one on one. So if that's your thing, like more power to you. And I'm not trying to be, you know, a, a, a mafia academic snob or whatever. But I just I can't get over whether we're talking about content on YouTube or just, you know, stuff you see on television or the movies that roll out, uh, you know, a couple times a year. You know, the big gangster movies that that come out. It, it's just how much. John Gotti or Whitey Bulger can you consume? I mean, it, so we I know we play in the margins, and sometimes we'll 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 touch uh, those those sure, two of course, uh, yeah. those two figures. Probably Whitey Bulger a lot more than John Gotti, but uh, try not to uh, be too um, generic. And I think when when you know every time that I'm tuning into some of this stuff, and again, it's not just the mafia content producers on YouTube. It's like when I'm on the bio channel or the history channel, it's like, okay, yeah, Sammy the Bull and right. Carmine Galante and Paul Castellano and Al Capone and Albert Anastasia being killed in the barbershop. It's like, oh, whatever. Yeah, and, and obviously, you know, we find all that stuff fascinating too. But we when we started this podcast many years ago, uh, Scott and I were on the same page that, um, A, we didn't want to just hit the same cliched, you know, Italian mafia topics 
that we wanted to talk about all the different families, not just New York, but Philly, Detroit, Boston, Chicago. And we didn't want to just talk about the Italians. We wanted to do episodes on African-American crime groups. We just did an episode on the Russian mafia a few weeks ago, Irish gangs, outlaw motorcycle bikers, clubs, yeah. drug cartels. So anyhow, I, I, if I may be so bold, I think that our show stands out from some of the other shows. And even some of those shows, we're friends with some of those people and we're happy for them. But um, they're very New York centric and, and very LCN centric. And we try to be a little bit more diverse here. Although um, today's episode will be about LCN, but we're going to make our way to the Windy City. <laughs> yeah. So we have a, a Chicago based episode. We've had some requests for Chicago content. And uh, we're going to mix it up a little bit, some some current events, but also tie it to some historical stuff. So um, pretty pretty sensational stuff. So, Bernie, you want to start us off with yeah, what's so going do, on with the just, outfit? We're just going to do a, a little bit of uh, news and notes, if you will, some um, outfit-related headlines that have broken over the last couple of weeks. Um, and uh, let's start with the fact that the last – uh, co-defendant from Operation Family Secrets, the historic landmark uh, case brought against the Chicago outfit back in the mid 2000s um, that resolved 18 previously unsolved mob murders. Uh, the last defendant from that case that will see freedom uh, has now seen freedom. Uh, Polly the Indian Shiro was released. It's been in prison since 05, so, uh, you know, we're talking, um, you know, 17 years behind bars. Um, was one of 14 defendants in that Operation Family Secrets case, and uh, I, I was fortunate enough to be in uh, the court when that, when that trial took place as a young buck reporter in Chicago, uh, covering the the case uh, for Chicago Magazine, as well as writing uh, my second book, Family Affair. Shameless plug. Go buy it on uh, Amazon. A, Try to give yeah. me a royalty. It's I have yet book. to see a royalty from that. Really? <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's a great for, book for uh, ten plus years. But uh, Paulie Shiro is home. Um, he actually might be uh, not in Chicago. I believe he might be in a, a halfway house out of Arizona because Paulie the Indian Shiro was the Chicago mobs. Uh, crew boss in Arizona uh, in the 1970s and 80s and uh, got caught up uh, with the Tony Spilatro uh, group. He was uh, one of Tony Spilatro, the Tony the Ant, uh, the guy that you see in the movie Casino played by Joe Pesci. Uh, that was, uh, you know, one of Paulie Shero's longtime childhood friends and was part of Tony's regime out on the West Coast and, and was running things in Arizona for him. Uh, got convicted of playing a role in a murder, uh, one of those 18 murders in Family Secrets, uh, was actually the last, no, the second to last murder uh, to take place, you know, timeline-wise. Um, and those murders ran from 1970 all the way to 1986. And uh, Shiro was was convicted of uh, being a, a lookout or getaway driver for uh, the murder of a guy named uh, Emil Little Val... Emil Little Mal Vachi, and he was a, a old timer living out in Phoenix. He traced his roots to Chicago, and uh, was you know running some some travel junkets for them. Uh, was he a made guy? Yeah, and he wasn't a made guy. He was an associate, kind of hanger on. Um, was part of Pauly Shiro's crew in Arizona, and there were worries that uh, he was uh, being subpoenaed uh, to testify against. Spilatro, who at that time was not just in hot water with the mob, uh, but he was in hot water with the feds. So this was like, I want to say a week or, or a week or two before Tony Spilatro met his maker and was murdered, you know, brutally, um, him and his brother. You see it in the movie Casino. But about a week or two before that, uh, he orders the murder of uh, Mal, little Malvachi. Pauly Shiro's involved in it. He's convicted at Family Secrets, and uh, now he's out, 85 years old, um, is probably the Indian. When when little Mal Vachi was killed in 1986, June of 86, um, he was 74. So he was an old, you know, old guy. Wow. Um, so uh, I, I, that's, that's uh, move on. Um, then we have the, uh, uh, the death, unfortunately of uh, one of the Chicago mob's biggest bookmakers uh, out of the Cicero crew. 
and we're going to talk a lot about the Cicero crew in this in this episode. Uh, Greg Pololian uh, was Armenian. Uh, was a was a uh, top bookmaker uh, under Jimmy I and Dino, aka Jimmy I, aka Jimmy the Ice Pick. Um, there are some people that that uh, claim that Jimmy I and Dino is running the outfit now, and he's the top guy. Um, and this was one of his closest friends. Uh, Polonian had a number of uh, gambling busts. He was actually under indictment uh, when he died. Uh, did some time in the late '90s, early 2000s, um, for for book uh, bookmaking, loan sharking, and racketeering, and uh, was very close to to Jimmy Iandino. So he passed away a couple months ago. So the the end of the summer. So uh, R.I.P. to Mr. Uh, Polowian and um, trying to get an age on him. Uh, he was 67 years old. So presumably he's he was kicking up directly. Yes, to... and uh, he had a two and a half year uh, prison term that he was got to do for the most recent bookmaking uh, conviction, but the judge uh, let him out in a medical, and, and uh, he died at home. So uh, in that case, who who would take over his book? Just I have other... no idea. But somebody, right? someone, yeah. Uh, but th- this guy's been running a big, big sports game, sports gambling operation uh, for the Cicero regime. Uh, dating back to the you know the seventies eighties, and and one of the things you know this was like, this is you know this is mafia one hundred and one, uh, in terms of how the you know the right hand moves and the left hand follows, so you know Polowian would be this was this was the case that he took in the nineties, but uh, you know guys that that would be betting with him would get into trouble, they didn't have the credit to go to a bank, so. Polonian said, "Oh, don't worry. I can uh, I can help you out. Go see my uh, go, go see my friend Jimmy I. Yeah, and Jimmy I will loan you the money. <laughs> and That's uh, guys trouble, it's a man. it's a vicious it's a vicious cycle. <laughs> right. right. Um, there's a great uh, FBI surveillance audio recording that's uh, online that you can get on YouTube. If you just go to YouTube and you you type in Jimmy I and Dino, and it's from uh, I think it's from the mid '80s." Or late eighties, and they got him on a on a wire talking about a guy that owes him two hundred bucks, and uh, it's 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 a it's classic, man. And, I, and Jimmy, I just you know chews into this kid, and it basically like uh, if you're not in my bar by six o'clock with that money, you don't owe me a thing. Like, and you're now you know you're you know you're playing. You're playing uh, dice with your life. Like, so either bring me the money or you don't owe me anything. Right. And now I'm going to come in and, yeah. and crush your head in. Yeah. And he says it. And the last thing he says, is, you know, I'll break every bone in your body if you don't bring me that money. Wow. Uh, so, yeah. So that was who Greg Polonian was was sending his uh, his indebted gamblers to. So just to go over the mechanics of it, I, I don't want to digress too much, but just it's kind of interesting, I think. So if you owe this dude money and he dies, there may be some debtors who think, oh, there we go. I could just wipe the books clean with this. And that's not how that's no. not how it works. <laughs> uh, I, I'm sure whether he's still kicking up to Jimmy I or not, and that remains to be seen. I think the case that he just took in the last couple of years, uh, Ian and Dino was not. Uh, implicated as a conspirator or as an undicted co-conspirator, but I've been told by people in Chicago uh, on the street that 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 operate that 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 sports gambling operation that uh, Greg was running was still kicking Outfit. up to Jimmy I. So yeah, if if you, <laughs> I would say that if uh, if you were someone in these last couple months since Greg died, if you thought that your tab was being wiped clear, right? I would say you know go to Cicero, go to the currency exchange that uh, Jimmy I spends his, his afternoons at, and I'm I'm pretty sure you you would tell you that you're <laughs> you're sadly mistaken if you think that <laughs> debt uh, yeah. is wiped clear just because Greg uh, is no longer uh, with. Us. Right, right. Um, and then uh, the last kind of small uh, headline that I'll touch on before we kind of get into the the, the meat of the episode. Um, also tying back to Family Secrets, one of the co-defendants in the Operation Family Secrets case, uh, Mickey Marcello, Big Mickey, uh, just copped a plea in a case with the feds where he's going to do about four months. 
uh, for stealing. Uh, he admitted to stealing $25,000 in Social Security benefits. Uh, just got sentenced this week, the week before Thanksgiving. And uh, he will report to federal prison in January and will spend the winter of 2023 as a guest of the federal government. He's uh, 71 years old right now, I believe. His brother was the number one defendant in Family Secrets. Mm -hmm. Little Jimmy, Jimmy the Man Marcello, was the boss of the outfit. And, uh, it, it, you know, it's. Uh, it, I think it's, it's, a, it's a job hazard. I mean, in, in that world, uh, whether you're, you're 25, 55, or 75, um, if, if you're living your life uh, making your living racketeering or trying to cut corners or trying to cheat the government, you know, it's going to catch up with you. And, it, and when you're someone like Mickey Marcello and you got a giant spotlight on you and your family, Especially after, you know, I think he did six years in Family Secrets or six or seven years in Family Secrets. It's been free now for, I don't know, about 10 years. Something that stood out to me when I read your article on Gangster Report, uh, let's see what you think about this is, first of all, well, two things. First of all, um, this is becoming a big racket for organized crime groups. Um, yeah. So this is um, especially with this group, these like baby boomer uh, mobsters that yeah. are now getting into their seventies. Right. Insurance fraud, yeah, and, and they they're finding ways, uh, yeah, to, to shortchange the government. Or um, we just I just wrote about something that wasn't uh, related to uh, Italians, but was related to. Armenians in Los Angeles, yes. where they found loopholes. They're bigger than the Eurasian they found, groups they found, are really into this. Well, they found loopholes in uh, government tax benefits for using biofuel yeah. instead of traditional gasoline. Oh, oh, right, right, right. Just finding different ways to cut into the government. Yeah. Um, kind of more white collar. Right, but I know the Eurasian crime groups, like the Russians, Armenians, are big into like insurance fraud. Uh, against Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security. Yeah. So that's what I was going to ask you. The second thing that stood out to me was when you look at the scale of some of those operations, I thought $20,000, that's that's nothing yeah. compared, well, the, to, what, the compared to what some of these groups are ripping off the taxpayers The for. indictment that came down in 2019, so it's been in the court system now for three years, um, the indictment was for 45000 but even and so, he, like, like, to, like some of these 20. bigger cases, yeah. millions. Right. I mean, they're scamming the government for millions of dollars. So Doesn't that play to my point, though, that if you're Mickey Marcello, if you're a member of the Marcello family, you're you're going to you're going to have a mic, a microscope yeah. on you and you're going to be scrutinized more than the average. Right. Yeah. Joke. Yeah. And also it's 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 easier for them to make cases against the Italians because they've been doing it for decades. They have informants. Uh, some of these like Eurasian crime groups. The Justice Department is still playing catch up with trying to figure out. Sometimes they don't have translators to understand what the fuck these guys are talking about, and and they're you know when they bug their social clubs and what have you. So um, it's interesting, yeah, that uh, that uh, you can make cases against the Italians easier. So the guy may go down for something that's really only a fraction of what some of these other crime groups are doing. Um, but I, so and and so and I'm sorry, what was his sentence again? Four months. Oh, okay, well, it's a slap on the wrist. Yeah, yeah, for, yeah. But I, I could be mistaken, but I'm pretty certain this is the first co-defendant from Family Secrets to get in trouble with the law. Yeah. After his family, after his role in Family Secrets was adjudicated, and he did this time uh, for the Family Secrets case. I don't think any of those fourteen defendants, some are dead. Um, but yeah. some are, but some of them are, 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 are still alive and some of them are allegedly still active. And, uh, Mickey Marcello was the first guy post family secrets to be back in trouble with the law. And, and in fairness to the, to the criminality of, of Mr. Marcello, th that may be all that they were able to account for in terms of forensic accounting. Right. So uh, presumably they probably took more than, than, uh, Twenty thousand dollars, but that's that's what they were able to get him on. And, so. may, and maybe there's there's some parts of uh, the Marcelo story that I am unaware uh, unaware of, but knowing that 
Jimmy Marcello right now, who's you know 78 years old, uh, was convicted in Family Secrets, convicted for playing a role in the murder of the Spilato brothers, that, that brutal strangulation, beating, stomping um, that, that, that you see in the movie Casino. <laughs> it's a very brutal, brutal, heinous scene. Uh, Marcel was the guy that drove the Spilatros to the, the house, slaughter the kill house yeah it wasn't isn't was never alleged to be involved in the murder itself um again that's not to say that jimmy marcello never got his hands dirty i know he was a suspect in a number of murders including murdering the the two men that he held responsible for the killing of his dad and that's how jimmy marcello actually allegedly was made his bones um his dad was an outfit lieutenant who got murdered an unsanctioned murdered, an unsanctioned murder in the early seventies, and and Jimmy allegedly by by uh, Italians, other Italians yeah, killed him. Yeah, avenged it. No, I mean who killed the old man? Who the another were, Italian guy that uh, was unsanctioned? Oh, okay, a, a, a loan shark victim of his. I see. Marcel was going to collect a loan sharking. I see. Debt and the loan shark killed him. Ah. Uh. uh and uh, then that loan shark and that loan shark's bodyguard. Ended up being killed in the months after, and Jimmy Marcello was alleged to have done that to avenge his, his dad's mm-hmm. murder. So I'm not trying to paint him as as a um, as someone that isn't dangerous because he 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 is, but I don't agree with having someone like Jimmy Marcello having to serve his time in Florence, which is the supermax. Yeah, um, along with. You know, terrorists El and Chapo. yeah, and guys like Vinny Bastiano, who I'm not. You know, that's he, not where El, Ch- El Chapo's at. Is um, I think El Chapo's at oh, he, a- ADX he now. Is too? He okay. was in New York, but right? No, okay. I'm pretty sure he's yeah. in ADX now. Um, but <laughs> Vinny Bastiano's in there because he was p- trying to put out murder contracts on judges and prosecutors. prosecutors. Joey Lombardo, who was also in the Family Secrets case, was the conciliary. Um, died in in Florence Supermax because he was trying to put out a murder contract on a judge. So I get I get that if you're trying to, you know, put out execution contracts on public servants, you you deserve to spend your time in the most maximum security prison possible. But at least publicly, it's not known what Jimmy Marcello did to warrant having to do his time in the. 23 hour underground lockdown you're out for like a half hour in like a a cage um it's the worst of the worst when it comes to incarceration by the federal government and it's and it's designed for the absolute worst of the worst and i just you know did they score points, uh, jimmy marcello was a bad guy and was a gangster and was probably a killer uh, or was a killer, it, you know, um, he was convicted of it, not of doing it with his own hands, but he probably has done it with his own hands. Uh, but I don't I don't believe and this will actually kind of get into where we're going also about kind of our, our ethical and moral beliefs in, in terms of uh, incarceration and capital punishment. I just don't see why Jimmy Marcel has to live out the rest of his life in, in a supermax for simply being involved in one mob related murder. So do you think that this is like uh, a trophy for like judges and yes. prosecutors when they could get someone in Supermax? It's like a, a notch on the belt, like I'm a no nonsense, tough on crime, you know. So so even if it's severe. And maybe the worry uh, is that Marcelo, uh, even though he's been locked up uh, since 2005, has had some type of say on what's going on, uh, you know, in the streets. Well, that's what and they're trying about to Larry Hoover, trying to limit, Chicago, right? Now. Who's also in, you know, right. Supermax, Larry Hoover, the head of the uh, Gangster Disciples. So, uh, which also I find a dubious, I, I, whatever. We had an episode on that. We yeah. talked about that. I think that's a dubious claim that he that he has. I don't think he has as much influence on the street as Uncle Sam thinks, but that's another. He's topic. Well, I'll tell you with Larry Hoover, and again, I'm digressing here, but with with someone like Larry Hoover. Particularly two, two. This applies to really only two people: Larry Hoover and Big Meat Demetrius Flannery, um, the two most 
notorious, iconic African-American uh, crime bosses that exist right now, um, they, for better or for worse, for, and we can talk about you know who you know who we prop up as heroes, but the and, and we can debate that. But the the fact is, both of those men hold sway over not thousands, not tens of thousands, not hundreds of thousands. They hold sway over millions of people. And that I don't think so. Not Hoover. I don't, I really don't. Not I hold sway. I'm not saying I'm anyone not, under forty. I don't think cares about what Larry in in Chicago. I, I just Larry Hoover's name in the street is, is like, uh, you know, the con, it's like a combination of John Gotti, Jesus Christ, and uh, and Tommy from Goodfellas. I mean, Larry Hoover is the definition of notorious. I'm not saying Larry Hoover is sitting there puppeteering the entire gang, Sir Disciples organization from from lock up the way that the federal government tries to make it seem. Yeah. I think I'm I, saying the reason that him and Meech scare the government is because of how much influence no, they have I, over Yeah, people. I can see that, but I, I, I think some 20-year-old gangbanger in Chicago, if you told them, here's an order from Larry Hoover, oh, yeah. I think you'd have... <laughs> I think you'd have some... Yes. <laughs> Some choice words for you no, about. I'm not. Dis I'm not. I'm not. I'm not. <laughs> what you can with do that. with that. What you can do with that order. Yeah. So the the legend versus what what actual um, uh, influence they have. We, you know, we could get into that. The semantic, but but, but anyhow, let's, back to the outfit, yeah, so although that is a Chicago topic. Let's let's talk about <laughs> a murder that was carried out by the state of Arizona last week. Um, it was capital punishment. Uh, the man's name was Murray Hooper. He was a former member of a Chicago African-American street gang known as the Royal Family. Royal Family was connected to the Chicago Mafia and did uh, muscle work and murder for hire uh, for the outfit. And Hooper was executed, again, via lethal injection. And uh, he is the only the second person to be convicted of a organized crime related offense to receive the death penalty only the second person in 80 years um first since 1999 and uh before 1999 the last you know mafia related execution by the state uh, was lepke lepke bookhalter mm -hmm. you know in new york went to the yeah. the, the electric chair uh, this is what the fifties. I think it was the forties. Late forties, yeah. And then David Leisure was a uh, a Syrian St. Louis mob enforcer uh, that uh, blew up uh, another Syrian mafia boss in St. Louis in 1980. I don't, I don't even know if that deserves the the death right. penalty, but uh, you know he, he was uh, put to death um, in Missouri in 1999. And then last week, and I, and I had no idea this was like scheduled or that this was, uh, you know, on the uh, no. horizon until until it happened. And uh, Murray Hooper um, is a national story. Yeah. And he was um, 1944, by the way, Louis Lepi Buck. OK, uh, Hooper was was 76 years old. He'd been on death row for 40 years. Um, and this was a. Chicago mob related murder and and just like the ones we've been talking about earlier the show with the Spalatro brothers um this was was gruesome it, it was heinous uh, it, it shocks the conscious conscience and uh you know I'll just I'll try to give a quick these were civilians quick this synopsis like, this yeah. wasn't like uh, right. gangsters not that that's okay but I'm just you know what I'm yeah. saying it's particularly gruesome when they're civilians I think so you know to try to give a, a quick you know 90 second synopsis my 90 second synopsis always lasts like nine Seven minutes, minutes. <laughs> but I'll try to keep this short. So, uh, as we said before, the, the Chicago mafia had a Arizona, uh, branch that was operating in the 1970s. Um, the Cicero crew was being run by Joe Ferriola, uh, who would go on to become the boss of the Chicago mafia in the eighties. But in the seventies, he was running the Cicero crew. Uh, he had, Two nephews, one uh, very, very infamous outfit hitman, Harry the Hook Alleman, um, who was half Mexican, 
but Mar- uh, but his his mom was Joe Ferriola's sister, and um, r- rose pretty quickly uh, in in the outfit, even though he was only half Italian. Um, was a fully inducted member, uh, became captain of what uh, was known as the Wild Bunch. You know, one of the most legendary, you know, hit squads in in Chicago underworld history. They were an enforcement unit uh, underneath Ferriol and the Cicero crew. They were connected to, you know, well over two dozen gangland homicides when they were uh, active between the early 70s and, and early to mid 80s. So part of Arizona, uh, before part of that Arizona crew's job was to help Tony Spilatro in Las Vegas launder money that was would eventually make its way once it was clean would make its way back to Chicago. Um but it needed to be laundered and the outfit had legitimate businesses set up in Arizona, California, uh and uh and Florida to push dirty money through. And Another one of Ferriola's nephews, a guy by the name of Robert Cruz, who went by the nickname Fat Bobby, uh, was dispatched to Arizona in the 70s. He wasn't in Phoenix. He was in Tempe, which is right next to Phoenix, and uh, was running drug rackets and helping Spilatro and those guys fence stolen goods that they were stealing in Vegas and and pushing through uh, the Phoenix area. And at one point, Bobby Cruz gets introduced via a associate of his to a businessman in Phoenix by the name of uh, Pat Redmond, Patrick Redmond, who owned a a printing company called Graphic Dimensions, I believe. And um, the Chicago outfit thought this was a perfect you know, uh, a shell, a, a perfect vessel rather to launder money that, that someone like Pat Redman wouldn't, uh, you know, alert or w- wouldn't, um, arouse suspicion. That, Wasn't it the cone, like his partner was the one that well, uh, they, they, approached the, or like the partner that was, that was the person that was kind of sketchy, right? That like was the, the con was the conduit so, between. So there was, so Bobby Cruz is stationed in Arizona. A guy that Bobby Cruz is doing business with knows Pat Redman's partner. Yeah. Okay. Right. And Pat Redman's partner, uh, I can't pronounce the guy's last name, does an introduction. Yeah. Bobby Cruz gets it in his mind that he wants to use this printing uh, company and tells the the guys back in Chicago, I got a, a great new way to launder our uh, our casino money, and uh, tries to take the business over. Um, first, they 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 play nice and they kind of finesse it, and they try to uh, kind of wine and dine Redmond and his partner, and offer them all of these contracts with Las Vegas casinos for printing printing yeah. gigs. To be lucrative, thinking yeah. that. Uh, they were going to be enticed to let the Chicago mob into the business. And Pat Redman was a, a you know pretty sharp guy and uh, wasn't having any of it and uh, told Bobby Cruz and, and his and his crew to get lost. At that point, Bobby Cruz and, and Joe Ferriola and the guys back in Chicago decided uh, to kind of pivot to a hostile takeover approach. And the hostile takeover included uh, murdering him. And uh, if you believe the government, taking over the business through the partner Mm -hmm. uh, and the partner's wife. Mm -hmm. Uh, Eventually, they wanted to, if you believe the government, kill the partner, too. Mm -hmm. And the wife, the partner's wife was allegedly in conversations with Bobby Cruz and and the bad guys, if you will. Um, She would eventually be indicted. And I think she was convicted at first. And then she had her case tossed out. But uh, so December 1980. They put a hit out on Pat Redman, and they're not just going to kill Pat Redman. They're going to kill his whole family. And Bobby Cruz knew these African-American uh, gang members from his time in prison. 
Murray Hooper, who they called uh, Hoop or Hoop the Hatter. I think there was a reference to Albert Anastasia that that, that, that Hooper was a, a bit of a wild card when he was um, when he was free and uh, was known for for wet work or for heavy work, uh, you know, in the streets. Um, the royal family was a. That's a great name, by the way, <laughs> just to, for a, for a, for a drug gang or whatever. Um, came out of kind of originated out of Statesville, um, prison in, in Illinois, and then eventually from the, you know once they got outside, they still kept the presence in prison, but were kind of set up on the west side uh, of Chicago and started doing a lot of muscle work. And Cruz recruits Murray Hooper and Willie Bracy, who was another member of the royal family, flies them out to uh, Phoenix in early December, and they. They orchestrated a drive-by on Redmond as he's leaving one of his favorite um, watering holes, and they're unsuccessful. Uh, Hooper and Bracey go back to Chicago, and then Cruz, two weeks later, three weeks later, decides they're going to do it on New Year's Eve, and he flies Hooper and Bracey from Chicago into Phoenix on, I believe, the night before New Year's Eve. And uh, on New Year's Eve, uh, Pat Redman, his wife, and his mother-in-law are preparing for a New Year's party. And it's about, I think, uh, 5 o'clock, 6 o'clock uh, at night. And Hooper, Bracey, and a, a dirty Phoenix police officer named Ed McCall uh, break into the house, take all three of them into the bedroom, tie their hands behind their back, put, like, pillowcases over their head, and then shoot them in the back of the head and cut their throat, rob the place. What they weren't expecting was that Pat Redman's wife survived it. Um, and then McCall, the, the dirty cop, is guilt-ridden and on New Year's Day confesses to his girlfriend who then goes to the police and the whole thing unravels pretty quickly. So that was what uh, Murray Hooper did to receive uh, the death penalty at, at, at his trial. He was convicted in 1982, was given the death penalty in 83. And the other guys also received the death penalty, Bracey and McCall, but they died in prison before. And Cruz was convicted too. And Cruz, Cruz is an had, interesting fi Cruz had five trials. Right. He was tried right. five times for this case. Uh, four convictions, four uh, reversals, and then finally he gets acquitted in 1995 after being on death row for 13 or 14 years. Comes back to Chicago, but only lasts two years before he's murdered. Um, and, uh, you know, it's neither here nor there, but there's some speculation that, that Harry Alleman, who was going on trial in 1997 for a, a murder from the 70s. His cousin, Fat Bobby Cruz, was very high on this attorney named Kevin McNally that had gotten Cruz off on this, on the fifth, in the, at the fifth trial. And, but that was a state case in Arizona. Um, you know, Harry uh, Allman was facing a case in state court but it was in illinois and kevin mcnally was a young attorney from arizona that probably was out of his depths going to illinois and handling something like that but alleman trusted bobby cruz from people i talked to that were in the courtroom mcnally kind of fell on his face during the proceedings alleman was very upset and you know Bobby Cruz ended up disappearing three days after being seen in court at Alleman's sentencing, where he was sentenced to life in prison. That was the last time he was seen in public. And uh, then Alleman, if you believe this theory, called on some of his, his buddies in the Wild Bunch uh, to get rid of his own cousin. At that point, Ferriola, the, the, the uncle who was the Cicero Capo, and then Eventually, the outfit boss was uh, had died in 1989. So he couldn't protect him. He had died of a, a bad heart. When you obviously this is just speculative, but from studying this stuff as long as I have, usually 
when a guy like that gets whacked, the causes are overdetermined, which is a pretentious term I'm borrowing from psychoanalysis, which means there's more than one yeah. reason. <laughs> that there might be a cattle, there might be like the the tip of the, or whatever, like the, the you know, the boiling point, but usually there's a a series of, of infractions or things that like, you know, enough is enough, and this person's a wild card, and we, you know. Well, I think there was... Like, like Spilatro, too. Yeah, I think there was also some belief that the reason that Bobby Cruz got sent out to Arizona in the first place was because people in Chicago didn't like him. Yeah. And Ferriola was trying to help out his nephew by getting him out of town. Yeah. And basically pushing him off on Paulie the Indian Shiro, who you mentioned in, in earlier in the episode who just got out of prison for the Family Secrets case, who was running things on in Arizona. Um, so I don't think uh, Harry Alleman, although was incredibly feared, people liked Harry Alleman. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think anybody really liked Fat Bobby Cruz. They were both Ferriola's nephews. It's yeah. interesting to me that they were Mexican. Yeah, I mean, that's something that, I mean, we know that that the outfit, just like Detroit, is known for having you know, multi-ethnic associates, but uh, if they were allegedly fully inducted members, I, that, that, that's, I, I don't understand how that, how that can happen. Because, the Marcellos, you know, I like how we're able to, there's a lot of synergy in this episode. Um, the Marcellos were, or are, and both of them are alive, the Marcellos are half Irish. Oh, on their uh, mom's side? On their side. mom's side. Well, that's something that uh, we know, uh, at least in other families, they've loosened the restrictions on. So, like, if your mom is not Italian, but your dad is 100%, yeah. you, can, you can be made. Which, back in the old days, you know, you had to be 100%. And, and if you really want to get technical about it, if you go way back, there were guys like, Bonanno, who would say you you couldn't even be Italian. You had to be a hundred percent Sicilian, or else you. So like you know they they didn't even like guys who were like Calabres or uh, uh, you know um, Nabiladon getting getting made. They did, they wanted you to be Sicilian, but but there were too many guys like Capone and Genova. There was too many non Sicilian guys who were who were heavyweights. And, and then so but you see all you, you see that. all this kind of cross pollination because um, you have. Alman and Cruz, who, who play a role in this uh, in this drama, they're both half Mexican. You have the half Mexican guys in the outfit reaching out to the African American um, street gang members. Yeah. Uh, so you know it, it's not as cut and dry when you're talking about you know families like Chicago and Detroit, specifically those two families who are very equal opportunity. A lot of cross pollination. A lot of we don't really care what color your skin is or where you trace your roots to. If you can make us money, if you can do something for us, uh, could be killing people. Um, yeah. Or, or you know, in, in Almond's case, uh, you know, he was known as a very, very proficient killer, and that's how he climbed the ranks. And you know, I was talking to Jimmy off mic, and he asked me, "Well, you know, where do you think?" Allman's trajectory w would have been if he would have not got caught up with, uh, you know, he, and he died in prison 10 years ago of, of lung cancer, but you know, he don't, he, he, in theory, he could still be alive right now. He'd be in his early eighties. Uh, and I think Harry Allman, if he doesn't get tripped up, um, you know, he's a guy that it could have been a boss. It could have been a, an administrator definitely could have been a capo. And I, I mean, we know like in the outfit, you've had guys, some high profile guys like Lefty Rosenthal. You've had, uh, what was that, Greasy Thumb? Uh, Greasy Gum Guzik. Guzik. And then you had uh, Tokyo Joe, Kenny oh, 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 Kenido. Yeah, right, right. But with all of those guys, none of them were made. So oh, it's still, Lenny, Lenny Patrick. The Lenny Ju Patrick, the, yeah. The Jewish. Uh, right. He was a big deal. But he had, so Lenny, so that, that's a perfect example, though, in Chicago. So Lenny Patrick ran the whole north side of Chicago. Yeah, he was a big deal. Uh, he ran Rogers Park. He wasn't officially made because he was Jewish. Right. But he had an equal amount of authority yeah. of any guy, any made guy that wasn't an underboss, a conciliary, or, you know, one of the bigger capos. But Lenny Patrick at at, a, at one point was probably, you know, if you were going to do an outfit uh, power index, I mean, he was in the top 15 
Yeah, and and out we, of a out of an organization that I had, you know, over a hundred people, and it also the a comparison with Detroit. We've talked about spe- specifically with the Jackaloni crew that the East Side guys took on them. That was pretty much all Sicilians, but um, with the Jackalones, your your status was about proximity to power. <laughs> so it depended on how close you were to the Jackalones more than if you were a made guy or not. And they like messing with the blacks. They like yeah. messing with the Jews. They love messing, messing with the Middle Easterners. Yeah. And they made them a Greeks. lot of the Greeks. That, and those four different uh, ethnic factions made the Jackalones a lot of money. Yeah. And, and buried a lot of bodies for them. Yeah. And if you if you were close to the brothers, then then you had a lot of street status. Maybe. And we had Patty Naughton on before. That, by the way, that, that video is on, I think, YouTube. I think uh, that is accessible to everyone now, right? The Patty Naughton. Uh, episode. Yes, it is on YouTube. So she yep. was undercover DE agent, infiltrated the the Jackaloni crew, and she even said in that episode that that some of those Jewish racketeers, because they were so close to the brothers, that the made guy Italian guys would have to defer to them, like soldiers would have to defer to some of the Jewish guys because, again, proximity to to power. And she got she got her hooks into Al Haiti. Yeah. Um. It, it sounded like she was. Almost became Al Haiti's girlfriend, or at least Al Haiti he thought, wanted, yeah, he thought wanted, that she was his girlfriend. Right, and you know, and Al Haiti was one of Billy Jackaloni's drivers, and you know, one of his you know go to emissaries or aide de camps, you know, someone who relayed messages. Yeah, and you know, she talked about being in a you know in a booth at the Golden Mushroom or at Dimitri's with Al Haiti, and you know, everyone around there is treating him. Yeah, right. Like he's the Godfather. Yeah, right. When right. he's just yeah the Godfather's guy's guy's guy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right, right. So I think you had, sometimes you had a similar thing in Chicago, but with all those cases. And Al Haiti, by the way, was, I believe, Syrian. That's why I think he was Middle Eastern. Oh, yeah, I don't know. Or maybe I, he was I, Irish. I always, yeah, I, I don't know. It's a good question. I, I think he was Middle Eastern. Um, but but he wasn't Italian. Well, he wasn't Italian. That's the point I'm making. Right. He wasn't Italian. But with all these guys in Chicago or Detroit, though, none of them are none of them are made. And so I still find it curious that Alleman and Cruz could have gotten their buttons. If they, I don't know. Let, let, let me be clear. Bobby Cruz did not oh, have did not a button. Have, okay, I don't think Bobby okay. Cruz had a button. I don't think he, he was anywhere close to having a okay, button. Okay, that would make sense. Um, he was a a, a true um, lackey, I think. Yeah. Um, but Harry Allman did have his button, and I do believe Harry Allman was was on the fast track yeah. uh, to you know a true uh, shot caller status um, if he you know if he's able to be free uh, in the eighties and nineties and two thousands. Because if your dad if your dad is Italian, but the name doesn't sound Italian, that doesn't matter because as long as there are so some specific examples, there was a guy in Philadelphia back in the day, Martinez. Yeah, Who Spanish Frank guy. Martinez. Even though his name was Spanish, right. he was Italian. But they called that on the streets. They called him Spanish right, Frank. The name is because of the name, the but name it had is... nothing to do with him actually being Spanish. Right. And in uh, Castellamare, a heavyweight back in the day, was Diego Playa. Which Diego Playa? That those are both Spanish names, first and last name. But he was a hundred percent Siciliano. He was from Castellamare, and so um, it's it's not it's not terribly uncommon for um, uh, you know guys to have. Well, I guess it's not common but it's not necessarily uncommon for them to have spanish sounding last names even if they're from italy but alamon i mean that that's this guy that doesn't sound italian i've never heard of that his you're saying his dad wasn't italian he's from mexico i think his dad was born in mexico it's just really unusual um uh, I, for for the, for him to be made i think at least as far as i can it is unusual my knowledge. it is unusual but it, we know that the Chicago outfit and Detroit, we're talking about these two Midwest families, they didn't go off that traditional New York blueprint. Yeah. And they they weren't beholden to them like some other um, groups would be. Like the Philly group always had to check with New York. Yeah. The, the, you know, the, the um, you know, that's what Detroit and Chicago never had to check with anybody. Yeah. They did things the way they wanted to do things. And if the, and if doing things meant that a guy that maybe wouldn't have been made in a New York family getting made, you know. They don't even do the ceremony. Right. <laughs> the Sopranos. <laughs> that pygmy thing in yeah. New Jersey. Yeah. Either it means something or doesn't. What is it? Yeah. It either means something or doesn't, Butchie. <laughs> they don't do the gun. They don't do the knife. Right. right. Um, well, one, let, just, um, just unpack it a little bit. I don't, I'm not someone, I don't believe in 
capital punishment. Yeah, let, let's uh, talk about that know, for a moment. Uh, you know, in principle, I don't agree with the notion of capital punishment. Um, and I think there, when we're talking about this case in particular, you know, Jimmy and I have have done our our own due diligence, uh, you know, in terms of going through the court files and and looking at how this thing went through the court system. And yeah, yeah. I'm not saying he's he's innocent, but it, it seems like there were a lot of question marks. I think with so. the convictions, with uh, throughout the you know what we found out throughout the appellate process, and with the. Uh, and from that, learning about the police work that was done to achieve these arrests and convictions, there was, you know, there were things that were, you know, a lot, lots of shades of gray. Yeah, I think, um, and it's not to say this guy was a virtuous guy because he clearly had a record. He he, he actually, it's kind of only scratched the surface in talking about him. He seemed like a bad guy, uh, convicted of killing his ex girlfriend yeah, yeah, or his girlfriend convicted of the manslaughter in the sixties. Right. That's how he met the outfit in state prison from yeah. serving that. Uh, sentence and then the couple weeks before this N- New Year's Eve massacre, he's involved in another triple murder uh, in Chicago. Yeah, but there, I think there are some enough red flags here too. And by the way, just as a rule, we you know we don't talk about partisan politics or ideology on this show. I think it plays I, a I think role for a good it. reason. But in this case, I think we, we or in other episodes, we will talk about criminal justice policy. So there's this sort of gray area where it's not sort of overtly political, but it is criminal justice policy. And and I have a uh, yeah some issues with this decision to execute him and I and I, I'm not with capital punishment I'm not not some like bleeding heart like um and there's other people I I really don't care if they get put to death but um um but I think the 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 system has to have integrity or else the, I think there's some problems here and it seems like you know there were no there's no forensic evidence linking him to this um the, in fact the only thing they have on him is the eyewitness the, oh, testimony yeah. of the, the the wife the wife pat redmond's wife who survived uh while her husband and her her mother were, were both murdered yeah and and um uh one questionable tactic here was when they had they, the lineup to her uh somebody put their arm on uh hooper which is um I mean that like that, tapped him on the shoulder, like shoulder. tapped him on the shoulder as like, this is the Mar- guy. <laughs> as Marilyn Redman is being is flown to Chicago for this lineup. Yeah, and they bring her in, and the the detective that's telling her, "Okay, I'm going to go get the guys." And as the detective's lining the guys up in front of her, before he leaves, he like taps one of them on the shoulder. Yeah, which I mean, is that's, Murray that's Hooper, who she policing. then who I mean, she then identifies. Right, and that's really bad policing. And and another thing was. Um, the weapon is still in the custody of, of the Arizona police. And um, I don't know if it would be state police or Phoenix PD, but either way, um, or the, the AG, whoever whoever has it down there. But um, they didn't test it. They could test that for forensic evidence to either yeah, they're exonerate afraid, they're or, af- or convict them. They're afraid of what they're going to find. But they're, right, which is, might be that, he, that his, his uh, DNA is not on that knife. And so... It seems like there was some politics in this decision by the attorney general at the time to appear as a real tough on and crime just, and push know, through this death penalty case. Contextualize, and, um, contextualize it. I mean, where we are in 2022, you know, Arizona is is a is a hotbed uh, of of political debate. Yeah, yeah, and right. dating back to the 2020 election. Yeah, it's um, a battleground state, and it, it's a state that uh, is pretty traditionally. Uh, red, right? Oh yeah, yeah. John McCain. Yeah, state. Yep. yeah. Oh, they, although they don't like him anymore down there, because the he went against because he went against Trump. <laughs> right. But the uh, it's it's increasingly becoming a purple state. I would say purplish leaning red. But but the the point is purplish means it's a battleground state, and like there's a lot at stake, right? I'm and, saying the fact that this happened now. It's been forty. This guy's been on death row for yeah, forty yeah, right. years, right? Um. And they decide to execute him in November of 2022, right in smack dab in the middle of the of yeah. the midterm um, right. election cycle. That seems like it was to score points. Yeah. It was to score points with the electorate and uh, as opposed to real justice uh, for the families. And again, it's not to uh, 
make I'm not making the argument. I, again, I'm not an expert on the case, but I'm not making the argument that this he was a great guy. Um, maybe he did have something to do with it. He, he certainly checks off a lot of boxes that would suggest he did have something to do with it. But the death penalty for with with no confession, no forensic evidence, and a and a a, a, a sketchy eyewitness testimonial. That seems to me pretty weak to to justify even for even if you support capital punishment as a policy. Um, Roberto's sending us a signal to wrap things up. Um, so um, even if you support capital punishment morally, uh, it seems to me like that's some pretty thin yeah <laughs> evidence to to go all the way because that is you know that's the worst punishment you can give someone. But so we'll shut this down. I'm just going to uh, read to you Murray Hooper's last words. Um, as he was, you know, going to get the jab, uh, he said, it's all been said, let it be done. Uh, don't be sad for me. Don't cry or say goodbye. Say, I'll see you later. Yeah. So let's go. Uh, and, and then one thing I, I'll mention that the, the state of their the state of Arizona needs to get this aspect of, of it cleaned up. This is the second execution, uh, carried out by the state of Arizona um, via lethal injection, where the medical techs have had a very difficult time completing the job, oh, and right, yeah. uh, it, it's That's prolonging a very, very difficult and and yeah, uh, mentally anguishing situation for I'm sure for the person that's being executed as well as the family members of both you know his family members and the victim's family members. Yeah. Uh, so you know everyone you, you know to, uh, you got to be on point for that. And I think in this case uh, he actually looked uh, looked at the crowd as it was going on and being and because the people are watching him be executed and, and he basically said, "Can you believe this? Like they can't even kill me right." Yeah, and he and by the way, for whatever it's worth, he to the very end said he didn't do this. Right. And you can say, well, what do you expect him to say? But if you're going to be executed either way, um, you know, I, and he I, did I have know. he did have a, we'll end with he had an eyewitness, uh, a female that claimed that she was with him at a New Year's Eve party in Chicago. Yes, right, right, that's right. So he he had a decent alibi. So, but anyhow, it's fascinating. Sometimes we will dabble in criminal justice policy, even though we 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 usually stay out of politics. But if it's CJ policy it, it, and organized crime related, we we will get into it. So. Anyhow, um, let's wrap up. Uh, good episode. People have been asking for more outfit episodes, so we're happy to provide that. Uh, again, thanks for listening. Please follow us on social media, and please subscribe. I'm Jimmy Bucciolato. I'm Scott Bernstein. We're out. <laughs>